Thank you, James. Open your Bibles up to the book of Ruth. And we continue on with this good book in the Bible. Just um, give you a background of what we've looked at the last couple of weeks. So the Bible says that Ruth happens during the time of what era of the Bible? You tell me. The Judges. Time of the Judges. So that reminds us. Uh, so the Judges is kind of like a big picture view of what's going on. And then Ruth, you get the microscope down and you find this little thing that happened, like a little gem right there in the middle of it. Everyone wasn't bad. There was still a remnant. So we found out that there was a famine in Judah. And we learned in the Bible that when there's a famine, it's God's judging. So God's judging Judah. So Elimelech, fellow we learned about, he takes Naomi, his wife, and their two children um, from Bethlehem in Judah, and they go to Moab. So just consider the word picture here in these names. So Elimelech means God is my king. Naomi means pleasant. Bethlehem means house of bread. Judah means praise. And Moab, in Psalm chapter 60, verse 8, is, the Bible says, Moab is my wash pot. So we can kind of look at it like a toilet. So here is God, my king, taking pleasant from the house of bread in praise to live at God's toilet. Sounds like a pretty bad deal, right? You just get the picture, a bad move. So Elimelech dies, and when he, he dies, the two sons, Chilion and, um, and Madon, they, they marry Moabite girls, and they're married for 10 years, and they, they don't have any children, and then these sons also die. So Naomi is left alone with the two daughter-in-laws. Naomi is embittered. She blames God. So news comes from Judah that the famine is over, and she realizes that her decision to come to Moab was probably a bad decision, so she, makes a, she decides to head back to Judah. And just thinking in our lives, you know, maybe you've said, if only I would have done that, or if only this thing. Well, if onlys don't correct anything. You, you can't just live in if onlys. We were trying to remember a, a, uh, a colloquial saying this week, don't cry over spilled milk. Right? Don't cry over spilled milk. So what, what you need to do if you had the problem, if you're sin, you need to repent. You need to clean up the mess if, as, as best as you can, and you need to seek God's help to try to make a better decision. So Naomi does this, I think, and she decides to move back to Bethlehem, to God's house of bread. And just in your own life, maybe you have something in your life that you're living in, if only. You need to get back to God's will, God's plan in your life, and be wise enough to realize that if it didn't work out right, humble yourself and with God's help, change. Change what God wants us to do. So Naomi heads back to Judah, and it's a dangerous journey for three women at that time. Remember, it's the time uh, when a man did what was right in his own eyes, and we learned about the um, insensitivity and the wickedness that happened to women back in the book of Judges. So they were vulnerable taking this trip alone. Um, in this chaotic and often violent time in the time of the judges. I mean, look, there's no street lights, there's no paved roads, there's no rest stops, there's no security, and, and they're walking on their own. They were easy prey for bandits or hooligans or, or wicked men or, or whatever. And then there was the Jordan River they had to cross, and, and they had to go up 2,000-foot mountain to get over to the Jordan uh, Valley where Bethlehem was. So nonetheless... Naomi and Ruth and Orpah, the two daughters-in-law, they head towards Judah. Now, just consider the travel route, and sometime here in the future, we want to, I think it would be interesting to study Bible geography. So consider that wall is the Mediterranean Sea. Everything over here is Israel, all right? We're going to say this is the uh, Dead Sea, and the Jordan River flows through here. Over here is Moab, sorry, you guys are living in God's toilet over here, but this is Moab here. And then north of Moab would be the three tribes that settled on the east side of the Jordan River. So you'd have Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So they're leaving Moab, and here's where they'd have to travel north this way 
And as they're traveling north, they would come to the border of Israel, which would be Reuben. Now, probably at that border, again, Naomi asks the daughters, she said, you guys ought to go back. Don't come with me. It's dangerous to come with me. And, and she tells them to go back. Orpah leaves. Ruth stays with her. So then they'd have to go, and they'd travel over the mountain and through the woods, not to grandmother's house, but down across the Jordan River, and they'd come down to Bethlehem. So that'd be the route they would have had to travel like that. Um, you know, Ru Naomi had told the girls, you know, go back. You know, only prejudice and hardship is going to come to you if you go to Judah. Because remember, the prejudice against the Moabite people. And we discussed the tragedy last week of only thinking about those girls' physical needs and not thinking about their spiritual needs. But she's sending them back to, to, to Chemish, that perverted God, instead of taking them to her God. But anyway, Orpah goes back home in verse 15, and Ruth stays with Naomi. Let's read these great verses again that we looked at last week in verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly, that's Naomi, Naomi saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her. Then she left speaking unto her. So... You know, the journey back home, she's heading back home. And isn't a journey back home, it's always better to have someone going along with you than, than being by yourself. No, no matter how far you stray away from God, coming home is always easier if you have support. And this is a Bible principle um, the Bible talks about in um, Galatians 6 2, what? Bear you one another's burdens. But we're supposed to help each other. Romans 15 1. Then we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. So they're encouraging each other. Ruth is encouraging Naomi as, as they head back to Bethlehem. Verse 19. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and they said, is this Naomi? So Ruth and Naomi, they returned safely to Bethlehem, and nothing but a miracle itself in those days for them women. Now Ruth's probably gawking around because um, she's in Bethlehem. She's probably never left Moab, God's wash pot, and now she's in this land of praise. And there's, there's just something special about a place that has God's hands of blessing on it. I mean, whether it's a church or whether it's a life, so God's hands of blessings is on Judah, and so she's gawking around, seeing this new sight, seeing these things. Now, everyone else is probably gawking at these two women that have come back to Jerusalem. Two women traveling by themselves from out of town, and they're shocked to see Naomi. You know, you know Bethlehem's not a huge town, and obviously they remembered this woman, and is that Naomi? I thought she was dead. You know, she's still alive, and, and she's by herself. I never thought I'd see her again. What about her family? And who's this Moabitess woman that she's with? And then they look at her, and they say this statement that maybe you've said, time hasn't treated her very well, has it? <laughs> you ever seen someone like that you haven't seen for a long time, and, and you look at them, and you, whoa, time hasn't treated them very well. Is this Naomi? Verse 20. She said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. So in other words, Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Now, notice in verse 21, she said, I went out full. So even though we learned in the beginning of the chapter that they had left Bethlehem in the time of the famine, is what it, what it said, looking back, Naomi realizes that 
You know, it really wasn't so bad back then. Look, we can get so spoiled by God's abundant blessings that we think that we are have it hard when really we're, we're well, well blessed in our lives. Look over at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look, the tendency in the human heart is to forget God amongst our blessings. Deuteronomy chapter 32. So she's back in Bethlehem and she looks around and she says, man, I went out full. I sure messed up. Deuteronomy 32, verse 13. God talking about this word that he calls Jeshuram, which is an English transliteration of the Hebrew word, which means the straight. It's a, it's, a, it's a term for Israel, for the Jews. So look at verse 13. He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Basham and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But Jeshurim waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods who they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. So just this sad progression. God blesses and God blesses, and then people start, this is just a human heart, that people start esteeming the blessings more than God. They lightly esteem, esteem God, the Bible says, and, you know, they're occupied with the blessings over the blesser. They are... They're focused on the goods and they forget the giver and so, so much time with the things over the maker of the things. And that's what happened to these people. And we learned that Naomi was full in Bethlehem back in the day, but they chose more things over God. And they thought, well, if we go to Moab, we can get richer. We can be better than staying here in, in Bethlehem. And it became their downfall. It became their downfall. Flip over to Psalms, if you would. Psalm 106. Psalm 106. So as she looks back and gets to Jerusalem, and obviously these decades has taken a toll on her physically as well as spiritually. But look at Psalm 106. Verse 15 says, God, he gave them their request, but sent leanness under their soul. Because verse 13 says, they soon forgot his works, and they waited not on his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. He gave them the request, but leanness to their souls. That this picture of getting all the things, but forgetting the creator that gave them. Look over at Psalm 62 and the warning that the Bible gives. Psalm 62. In verse 10. Psalm 62, 10. Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. You know, we're supposed to put our heart upon God and nothing wrong with riches, but you be careful they don't take your mind and your heart away from God. Amen. Okay, so back over to our text. So here's Here's Ruth. She's away from God and God's people for at least 10 years. The sons were married for 10 years. Who knows how long they lived there before the sons got married. But we seldom get away uh, from God and return uh, better than we were when we got away from God. We're certainly not going to return. So she left Bethlehem with a full life. But what a difference. A decade had made in her life away from God, away from God's people, away from God's blessing. And she returns home and the people say, is this Naomi? She says, no, I'm not the same Naomi. I used to be pleasant, but now I'm bitter. So if you're away from God this morning, the, the quicker you return to God, the better. Don't wait like Jonah until you get into the whale's belly. <laughs> you know, don't wait like 
the prodigal son until you get into the pigsty. Get, get, get home quick, and, and God wants to restore. I read this quote by Vance Havner. He said, our biggest, one of our biggest problems in the church today is, the, is this vast majority of Sunday morning Christians who claim to have known the master's cure and who return not at other times to worship to thank him by presence, prayer, testimony, and support of his church. In fact, the whole Christian life is one big thank you, the living expression of our gratitude to God for his goodness. But we take him for granted, and what we take for granted, we never take seriously. Pretty good. So verse 21, back in our text in Ruth. So she makes this statement, I went out full, and the Lord brought me home again empty. Why then call thou me Naomi, or call ye me Naomi? Look, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So she gives this statement, the Lord testified against me, and then affliction came upon her. So there's a great, a great truth here, just practically for our lives. God will speak to us first to get us on the right path before he has to chasten us to get us on the right path. That's God. So Naomi's comment may have been just a talk of a hurting woman outside of God's will, or she may have been led by the Holy Spirit of God to proclaim some truth that we all can learn by. So we look at this thing. It says, she said, the Lord hath testified against me. So maybe God spoke to her and Elimelech before they left Bethlehem 10 years ago. He might have warned them, you know, this is the place God wants you to be. You shouldn't go to Moab. There's false gods there. It'll draw you away from God. You need to trust in the Lord with all your heart. You need to not set your affections on the things of the world, but on the things that are above. Whatever he might say, uh, you know, God, God would do this. And remember the covenant that I have with you and my promises. And God testified to them. But they didn't heed. So this pleasant woman becomes bitter and God had to afflict her to get her to come home. Like the, chast- the chastising of the Lord is a, is a good thing. God wants us to go right because it's the best thing for us. We're going to look in Bible school, the, you know, the Ten Commandments are rules, and sometimes people say, well, rules are bad things. Well, rules are good things. I mean, just like, you know, they have to tell you, you know, shampoo, put it on top of your head, not in your mouth. <laughs> it's a good rule to know. You're not supposed to eat it. And God gives us rules in our life. So he teaches us through the scriptures. He teaches us through preaching. He teaches us through devotions. He teaches us through the Holy Spirit, through the still, small voice of God, through our conscience, through counsel, through parents, through, through, you know, whatever. God wants to teach us through warnings so that we don't go the wrong direction. Romans 2, 4 says, Or despiseth thou the richness of his goodness, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God. So God, in His grace and His goodness, tries to woo you to get on the right road and to stay there. And so when you when chastisement comes in your life, that wasn't God's preferred method to get you on the right path. God didn't want to have to cause affliction in your life. Look, no decent parent enjoys paddling their children. It's not something a parent enjoys, and God is certainly more than a decent heavenly father. It's not his enjoyment, it's not his method, but he does it to to protect you, to to love you. Look over at Lamentations chapter 3. Then we're going to get into the story of Ruth. But just some principles for our lives. We are so wise to quickly respond to God's speaking to us in, in the scripture, in the, in the conviction, whatever, because God says, I'm, I'm trying to warn you, I'm trying to woo you so you don't get hurt or I'm going to have to pull you and maybe chasten you to get you away from that bad. Lamentations. So you got to look at Isaiah and Jeremiah and this little book after Jeremiah, after Psalms and Proverbs. You can find it. Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3. So just look what it says about God. I just want you to see about the afflictions that he puts on, the chastisement that a loving father would give to correct us. 
Lamentations 3, verse 31. Lamentations 3, verse 31. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, there's the chase, chastening. I mean, chastening is, isn't pleasant. I mean, no one likes the paddling. Yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. That's not his preferred method. He wants us to conform through the preaching and through the convicting. Amen. You see it? Now, David said in Psalm 119, he said, it's good that I was afflicted that I could see God's law and go the right direction. And David understood that's true. So back in our text, Naomi returns to Bethlehem in, in verse 21 and, 20, and um, verse 19. And verse 22 says, so Naomi returned. And we see that. She, she returned. Ten years of her life out of God's will. And she finally returns. She ignored God's testimony. She's enduring God's chastisement. And now she's back to the house of bread in the land of praise out of God's wash pot. All right? She, she's returned. I, the devil always wants to make sin look good. I read a story, probably not true, but it's a good story, that there was a garbage strike over the Christmas season, and so the garbage was piling up, stinking, and, and a piling up mess, and one fellow had a bright idea, so he got his garbage, and he boxed it up, and he wrapped it in Christmas gift wrap, and he set it out on his porch, and then thieves stole it, and he got his garbage picked up, you see. Now... It's like the devil trying to fool us that, you know, stinking sin is nice and he wraps it up in, in, in tinsel and foil and, and that messy sin is nice, but it's just wrapped up garbage, okay? So Naomi found out that this life away from God wasn't what it was all cracked up to be and she comes back. She returned and her sin didn't leave her in better shape than, he found, it, than it found her. Is this Naomi? See it? So verse 22, they, they, find, they come to Bethlehem, they returned, um, Naomi, and they find a place and settle down in Bethlehem. Now notice from this point on, different times, it calls Ruth the Moabitess. So Naomi turned, and Ruth the Moabitess. New, Ruth the Moabitess, just reminding her of her culture, where she's from, this second-class citizen. She's returned also. Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, so depending on the rains uh, of the seasons, I read that the barley harvest, generally the, the uh, spring, the winter crops, barley would be planted in the, in the fall and grow because it's a temperate climate there, and it'd be harvested in mid-April, approximately. Where, and then the wheat harvest would be pro harvested a month later. So May, April, May, June time frame. So they're in the, the Bethlehem at the time of the harvest. Chapter 2. Here we're introduced to our next main character and just uh, gives a little side about him. Naomi had a kinsman, and we'll learn about that kinsman, very important in weeks to come, of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. He's a wealthy landowner, some relative of Elimelech, he lives in Bethlehem. His name means strength. And the Bible calls him, you know, a, a mighty man of wealth. Verse 2. And Ruth, the Moabitess, just reminded of her reproach, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Ears of corn, just a generic thing for crops, for grain. It's the barley harvest. Now, look, they were very poor. They were widows. They'd come from this outcast country, and, and now they're here. Remember, we talked about the, a woman in that time having a hard time getting work and were taken care of by, by the men. So they had no income. They're widows. They had found some shack to live in. So Ruth decides to go out and try to get some food for them in whatever way that she could. Now, she had learned probably through Naomi or maybe their time in town that God had provided a, a welfare program for, 
helping the poor in, in that nation. And um, look over at Leviticus chapter 19. It's called gleaning. Gleaning. So you see the word glean in our words. She's going to go and glean. Glean. Leviticus chapter 19. God's laws were laid out for the children of Israel as they're going to be living as God as their ruler. And one of these laws was the law of gleaning. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9. This provision for the poor. Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 9. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, that's what they're going to be doing with this barley, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt not glean the vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of the vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. Why? Well, because I'm the Lord your God. I told you to. This is what we're going to do in our land. Deuteronomy chapter 24, I'll read it to you. If I get there first, you can look. If not, verse 19, it says the same thing as God reiterates the law. And he, he tells us in Deuteronomy 24, 19, when thou cuttest down thine harvest in the field, Deuteronomy 24, 19, and hast forgot a sheath in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, that the Lord may bless thee in all the work of thy hands. So glean, the gleaning, that was what was left after the harvest, after the first harvest. It's the products that were dropped when, when they were gathering things. It's the, it's the grain that fell off the stalk. It's the stalks that were missed. It's the plants that were overlooked. It's, it's areas that maybe they forgot to harvest behind a tree or in, a, in something. So the law was when you harvest your grain or whatever, you're supposed to leave the edges of the field unharvested and you don't make a second pass through the field to get what you might have missed the first time. Anything left lying on the ground, you leave there. And then the poor were permitted to enter into the field and to gather off the gleanings, what was left, or to, to glean off of the uh, unharvested crops that were on the corners of the field. That way, there's going to be no starving people in Israel. And that way, the poor kept their dignity by working still, forgetting the food they were going to get. And it wasn't just a handout to them. So the farmer was to keep, keep the... Um, border unharvested and to make one pass through the field and then the leftovers the poor people could glean you understand that word glean and we'll see how that works okay so that's what the law was and that's what Ruth is going to go do so here we have the barley harvest in, in verse 2 and Ruth and Naomi have nothing and so she's learned this law of gleaning and she says Naomi to, to her mother-in-law she says I'm gonna go out and try to find a field where I can glean and somewhere where I can find some grace and some allowance, and I'm going to go out to the field and try to get us some grain so we can make some barley pancakes or whatever they wanted to make. Now remember, this is the period of the judges. So probably many people aren't following, well, we know many people aren't following God's laws. So there's, she's saying, I'm going to go to a field where maybe I can find grace and, and someone will allow me. So, and, and besides that, Ruth is a Moabitess. And she's probably going to be shunned by a lot of people. So she says, I'm going to go out and do this. And Naomi says, good idea. So Ruth heads out and, and goes to try to find some, some gleanings. Verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, we, we get a big picture here, but let's divide it up a little bit. We're not told, but most probably she was rebuffed a few times trying to go to different fields. So generally, the, the fields would be out in the country, and people would live in Bethlehem, and then the fields would be out there. I remember in Moldova, it was like that. People didn't live right on their lands like farmers do now. The, the fields were out there, and everyone had their fields, and people lived in the city. Then they'd go out to the field. So picture Naomi or Ruth. There's, there's dirt paths that go between barley fields on different sides, and she's walking down these fields trying to find if there's some place where they would allow her to glean. And so maybe she goes to one and, you know, can I glean your field? And they maybe say to her, well, get away from me. We don't want your kind here, Moabitess. 
and maybe she'd go to another field and they say, what are you talking about? This is our field. We're not following that old-fashioned law anymore. And she'd go to another field and the guys up there would say, hey, yeah, baby, why don't you come on up here and be with us? And she said, that's not safe to go there. And that was a, probably a situation that she had to fear. Can't you just picture, though, as she's walking through this path, the angels of God in heaven are saying, no, don't go there, prodding her, yeah, go this way. No, turn the corner there. We've got a plan for you over here. I like it. Notice in verse 3 it says, and she went and came and gleamed in the field of the reapers as her hap was, as her hap was, to light upon part of the field. Look, God's providence led her to the field of Boaz, that guy we learned about in verse 1. And, his, and, and she goes there, and she says, can I glean in your field? And, and the foreman says, yeah, I mean, our boss told us to let any gleaners come in because he obeys the Bible in Leviticus 19, and he said gleaners could come. So she goes and works in the field of Boaz. Well, she's, been, uh, she's working the harvesters, the reapers. They're going through the field. They're doing what reapers do. They got their scythes, and they got their baskets, and they're cutting it down, and they're, they're taking the things and the stalks and this and that, and... and Ruth is there gleaning behind them, picking up leftovers and putting it in her little basket. And lo and behold, she's been working all morning, and Boaz shows up from his business in Bethlehem, just coincidentally, right at that time. Verse 4, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Well, you know, he owns the land. He's the landowner. He's got other business to do, and we find out later in the book of Ruth that He's actually on the city council. He's, we find him in the gate of the city doing city business. So he probably had city business. Now he just happens to come at that time. And we see God's timing. And said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the, the Lord bless thee. So just, just consider this thing. Here's God, and without violating man's ability to make moral choices, God is moving in the lives of Ruth and Boaz, where they can meet each other and God's will can be accomplished in their lives. I read this quote from A.W. Tozer in a little book called Knowledge of the Holy. He said, to believe actively that our Heavenly Father constantly spreads around us providential circumstances that work for our present good and our everlasting well-being brings to the soul a veritable benediction. Most of us go through life praying a little, planning a little, jockeying for position, hoping but never quite certain of anything, and always secretly afraid that we will miss the way. This is a tragic waste of truth and never gives rest to the heart. There's a better way. God has charged himself with full responsibility for our eternal happiness and stands ready to take over the management of our lives the moment we turn in faith to him. Isn't that good? So Boaz waves uh, to his guys. He comes to Bethlehem, and he, and he said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. And they respond, and you see a little bit of the spiritual relationship with this guy. I like this kind of worker-boss relationship, right? Mutual respect. God's honored. And now the first thing he notices when he comes to the field after he greets the guys, verse 5, then said Boaz unto his servant that was over the reapers, the foreman, whose damsel is this? You know, who's damsel? You know, is she, is she married? What's she doing here? And he notices her and, you know, love at first sight. <laughs> the foreman tells him, you know, there's, this is big news in town about Naomi coming back to town. Everyone has been buzzing about that, and she's with this Moabitess. And the servant that was set over the reapers, the, the foreman answered and said, it's the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Look, she's been, she's been working all day here, and she came in, and we've, she's been working, and, and now she's taking a little break. The house would be like a tent or a, a covered pavilion, a porch to get out of the sun. Look, we're in this uh, hard, hard desert climate, and to get water, et cetera. And so he tells about Ruth. Look, God's providence had now brought Boaz and Ruth together. How's this man of the family of Elimelech, how's he going to respond to this destitute foreign girl? And their encounter, it's a turning point in the story. What, what's going to happen? And this is where we'd say to be continued next week.
Well, Boaz goes over and talks to her. And he, he, he said unto, Boaz said unto Ruth, verse 8, Harvest, or hearest thou not, my daughter? Listen to me. Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Next, next day when you're going out to work, don't have to try to find another field. Come here. You're welcome to glean in my field. In fact, you're not only welcome to glean in my field, but you can have a position with, with the, the maids here that are working here. I want you to come back and, and work for me. Let not thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, or let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go over after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? Look, he's given her protection. Remember the, the day. She's an uh, eligible young woman. And, and then he says, And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. He's given her provision for the needs that, that she would have. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger. I mean, she's, she's probably nervous. She's stunned, and, and no one has talked to her like that. And you consider this Boaz all through the, the chapter, the book. He's a picture of God. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see in that verse, he gave her protection. Well, doesn't God do that for us? He protects us from the wiles of the devil, and he protects us from everlasting hell. And then he gave her provision. And doesn't God provide for our needs? And he sure is a good God, isn't he? And then she gives him praise. She bows her face to the ground and she said, why have I found grace in thine eyes? And isn't that what we all could say to God? Man, why did I find grace in your eyes? Why would you come to me seeing I'm but a stranger? I'm nobody. And you're God? Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath fully been shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of, of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. We know how you've been a blessing to Naomi and what you've been through, and it's, it, we, everyone knows the story's been told. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings... Thou art come to trust. And we talked about it last week. She now is a believer in God, not in the false gods. And, and God, you know, God bless you for what you do. The Bible says in Hebrews that God's not unfaithful to forget the, the labor of love that you've done for him. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids, and, and, Boaz, and Boaz said unto her, well, you know, lunchtime's here. At mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he, he, reached, her, he, he reached her parched corn. And she did eat and was sufficed and left. And, and he fed her. So, I mean, you think about our relationship with God. Here's Ruth, the, the Gentile who now has favor with Boaz. It was a privilege for her to sit at the table with with the foreman and, and the boss. And there was provision for her, and it was a position. She sat by him, and he, it, was, it was personal. I mean, he dipped into the, the, parched, the, the popcorn or whatever was there, the good stuff, and he gave her the, the, the food out of his own hand, and it's a picture. It was plenty, and the Bible says she was full and sufficed, and then she even asked for a doggy bag to take home to Naomi, and you find out at the... At the last verse that she, 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 she gave whatever was left over, she, she took home. And what a blessing. Now, just read a couple more verses. And when she was risen up to glean again, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. So the gleaners sometimes, the guys would be working, and the gleaners would get up too close to them, and they'd have to shoo them back. You know, this is the, the reaping work. Though. But if she gets up too close and is getting some of the good stuff, just let it go. Just let her be with you. He's looking out for her. He's taking care of her. He's providing for her. And then he says this. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them. 
and rebuke her not. Handfuls of purpose. So here's the gleaners. They're reaping the field and they're, they're getting the stuff. And, and then she, on purpose, they're supposed to drop some things down there so that she wouldn't have to work so hard to pick up the supplies. Handfuls of purpose. And it's not like God sometime for us. I mean, that's our God. He gives little blessings if you'll just see them and if you'll receive them. These special privileges that, that God gives to us. And so many times we miss it because we're not focused on the goodness of God, but we're focused on all the problems. But just focus on the goodness of God and those little extra blessings that he gives. The handfuls of purpose, I like it. And so she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned. It was about an ephah of barley, and it was a lot. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth. And, and look, she gave her the little doggy bag and gave her that she had reserved after she was sufficed back there in verse, verse 14. Now the story continues, a beautiful love story happening here. The first chapter of Ruth takes about 10 years to take place. We find Elimelech leaving the house of bread and the place of praise and going into God's wash pot and him dying and the sons getting married and them dying. And however, the second chapter of Ruth, it takes place in one day. And here's the thought, what a difference a day can make. If, if you put God first in your life and blessed him, and God through his providence and sovereignty, he works in the life of Boaz and Ruth as they meet in the fields, amen? Let's pray, God, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for this beautiful story of your grace. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that we can learn from our, our own experience through this. And Lord, I pray that we would consider your goodness and the providence of God in our lives and count our blessings more than our burdens. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Bless us as we continue on in worship today in Christ's name. Amen. All right.